Good afternoon, welcome back to part two of this series of video tutorials on chapter 10 of Stevenson's Jekyll and Hyde. If you have not already watched part one of this uh, lesson, please go back and watch it because this won't make much sense to you. We are going to go straight into, or straight back into I should say, our close reading of that opening page and a half. We'd left off uh, by talking about Jekyll's duality, by discussing uh, the structure of the chapter in relation to the entire novel, and by talking about Stevenson's use of ambiguity in his description, in his characterization of Jekyll. And crucially, why? Why is this fault or this irregularity in Jekyll? Why is it so vague? Why is it so ambiguous? What actually is it that is wrong with him? What is the, what is the irregularity? What is the fault that he feels the need to hide? Let's go straight back and I'll see you shortly. Once again, here's the chapter summary. Uh, I will stop talking and you won't hear my voice for some time. Okay, so once again we have in Jekyll's description of his background and his and why he felt the need to perform this experiment, we have these ambiguous these ambiguous euphemisms like irregularities, uh, guilty. Um, we don't know exactly what these irregularities are. What what exactly was irregular about Jekyll? He's not specified. And think about the allegorical significance there. Why doesn't he specify what's wrong with him? What is he guilty of? Um, so he, he gives us a sense that he has had to live this double life. He's had to indulge and gratify some of these desires and some of these irregularities. He's not been a perfect man. It's really clear that he's, been, for the most part, been good. But at points in his life, that evil part of him has overwhelmed him. And he's had to gratify that side of him. But it doesn't exactly explain what the irregularities are. And it's clear that that is deliberately euphemistic. It, again, gives this allegory a much broader significance. We then have words like hiding again, uh, which comes up through a lot. We Last time we talked about the concealing pleasures. Now we're talking about hiding irregularities. Again, he's not clear about what those are. But once again, we have this reiteration of the dual life and the double life that he has had to lead. And then we have this expression of a morbid sense of shame. And this, again, if you think about earlier in the last lesson, how he talks about how he feels the desire to carry his head high. Well, once again, we have this reiteration, this repeat of a similar idea. This idea that he felt a sense of shame for whatever irregularity he had. Just to remind you, to give you some, uh, uh, some, some more of a better, some, a better view. Going back to this idea of Jekyll's makeup. Remember he, the dual identity. Part of him is evil, part of him is good. The evil causes him shame, but we're not sure what he's done that makes him feel shame. We don't know how he's acted upon these feelings. So he says later, it was in my good side uh, that I actually noticed the degradation in my fault. So he, he notices that something is wrong with him. And by degrade, he means something that is, um, in a sense, shameful, something that is repulsive, something that is repugnant, uh, something that's humiliating, in a sense. So he's, he feels humiliated by whatever it is that's irregular about him. And he says that this degradation has caused a deeper trench than in the majority of men. And just to be very clear, the trench, I'll draw it here, the trench describes the divide between his evil side and his good side. The trench is in between. So he's saying there's a deeper trench than the majority of men which severed in me the provinces of good and ill, which compound man's dual nature. So here's our evil, here's our good. 
So he's saying in, in, in his own personality, this divide between the two, this trench, which is obviously a metaphor, is deeper and that they are more separate than most men. And what is also interesting is that he's not speaking in a, in a manner that's hypothetical. He's not, he's not speaking as though this might be the case. He speaks as, it, as though he has discovered, and, and he has, he's discovered a very important truth which is that man has a dual nature, a nature that is divided between good and evil, or however you want to read the novel, whatever you think the, the duality represents. There are lots of references to division and to dividing and to splitting th throughout this passage. Uh, again, it reiterates this idea of doubleness. So man's dual nature is the proposition that he makes, and he says it boldly because, of course, he's discovered that man really is uh, a dual creature, and he's separated the two, Hyde and Jekyll, of course. He then talks about, again, what led him to performing these experiments. And he, clearly, he's felt driven to perform these experiments because of uh, the shame that he's mentioned. He says that um, he's a profound double dealer. Uh, he has both sides of him are in dead earnest. So go back to this image of the two sides. They're both in opposition. That's what duality means. So good and evil are a constant battle, uh, which forces them to lead a double life because sometimes the evil side will win over the good side. Sometimes the good side will conquer the evil side. So he's forced to live a double life. And again, we talked in the last lesson about how that might be a reference to homosexuality and, all, and various things that this novel might be an allegory for. What's interesting, again, is how many times he talks about shame, though. Here he says, I was no more myself when I laid aside restraint and plunged in shame. And just thinking about these word choices, he's used words like conceal, hid. Uh, he's now used the word restrain. So it's as though the good side is trying to push down, trying to repress the evil side and failing. And we talked last lesson, I showed you this image that I'll, put, I'll, I'll draw for you here. We talked about this idea of repression. We talked about a spring, and apologies science teachers. Here's a normal spring. You push that spring down, and it is pushed down like that. And then the force you've exerted on the spring will bounce back. And the spring will, once you release that force, it will rebound, right? That's what, we, that's what we're talking about when we talk about repression. So Jekyll has been trying to push down the evil side, trying to hide it, trying to conceal it, trying to restrain it, but it keeps coming back even stronger every, every single time. And it's one of the core themes of repression in the whole novel. The idea that he struggles to tie down the evil side from throughout his life and uh, once the experiment's completed. So once again, we have this idea of, of trying to control the evil side. And once again, we have a reference to shame. And I think, it's, I think this word shame is incredibly important because it reiterates this idea that whatever Jekyll, whatever's wrong with Jekyll, whatever he does that he feels shameful about is clearly something that is a taboo or something that is deviant. Uh, we know that as Hyde, he performs acts of violence. So presumably there's something within him that, that enjoys uh, committing acts of violence. Remember that, that Hyde tramples on the girl in chapter one. He punches a woman in the face later in the novel. He murders someone. So clearly Jekyll, in, Jekyll has a part of him that is a murderer, that is a criminal, that is someone who, has, who enjoys inflicting pain on others. But it could also, the shame could also relate to sexuality. And we, we've talked about how this novel has been read. Uh, you know, there is a queer reading you can perform in this novel, this idea of reading it from a perspective of it being about homosexuality. But notice just how many times this word comes up in the opening chapter, shame, shame, shame. And the shame drives him to this experiment. He, he can't bear the shame any longer and he feels the need to divide his personality. He then talks, and I'll move this down slightly, he then talks about his science, and we've talked about this lots of times, so I'm not going to go into great detail, but he says that his interest in science uh, was Holly towards the mystic and the transcendental. We know that. We've talked about this lots of times. He's interested in severing his personality. He's interested in performing 
scientific experiments that will allow him to allow him I, i'm going to put it into different words here they will they will grant him freedom and he talks about this later on but these, this experiment will grant him some sort of freedom they will allow him to indulge in his evil desires uh, and also allow him to not feel that shame anymore so it's really important we think about why he chooses this particular route of science because he wants to be freed of his own personality he wants to be freed of the burden and the shame that he's experienced okay we have reached a checkpoint please again remember you can follow the timings that i've suggested read the questions carefully uh, and pause the video just to let you know again and a kind of a recommendation re-watch certain sections if you need to rewind that's absolutely fine it's to be encouraged given the fact we're using video now uh, so try to make the most of that rewind re-watch certain sections please pause the video and i'll see you shortly Welcome back. Continuing with our reading of the passage, Jekyll then uses metaphors to describe his duality and his realisation that man, in his words, is not one but two. That's the key discovery that he believes he has made, that man is actually not a single entity, is actually more than one entity. And he uses this uh, metaphor throughout the passage. Uh, he uses two. One is the warring metaphor. He describes, uh, I'll read the quote out, a perennial war among my members. And what he's talking about in terms of his members is, is he really means his mind. And he means that his mind is at war because there is the good part of his brain and, and the evil part of his brain. Uh, and it's almost, it's quite a materialist reading. It's almost if he feels that half his brain is evil, half it is, is not. Um, but he uses this warring analogy throughout the passage and he uses it actually throughout the chapter the idea of a man at war with himself the second metaphor that he uses which i think is very interesting is the twin metaphor and i'll show you an image so the the twin metaphor becomes a motif uh, it's obviously a very uh, evocative and apt metaphor for the human mind specifically the dual nature of human mind so if you look at your screen you know one of the twins represents the good part of us one of the twins represents the evil part of us but as you can see these twins are bound together in the same place the womb so it's a, it's a appropriate metaphor for what jekyll is experiencing the dualism he's experiencing the first time he mentions it uh, he talks about the perennial war amongst my members which we just talked about uh, he then refers to later in the passage right at the end he says uh, the agonized womb of consciousness uh, and he describes the polar twins of good and evil he also re refers uh, to the upright twin and the lowly twin so twins come up a lot in this passage because like i said it's an appropriate metaphor for jekyll's consciousness and his subconsciousness i suppose you could see twin a on the left hand side as his conscious self twin b as his unconscious self remember he's writing at a time when there isn't much of an understanding of psychology so the dual image of the brain and for the victorians is something that they didn't really understand at all but he's proposing that uh, the mind is made up of good and evil another reason why twins might be used as a metaphor is going back to the cain and abel story of good and evil from the bible the illusion of you know, one of, of Cain being the murderer and that being, and, and all of us having an inner Cain, uh, an inner murderer within, within all of us, an evil twin within all of us. So the twin metaphor is very powerful. And of course, if we're going to read it from that Freudian perspective, it also uh, helps us to understand Freud's uh, theories and uh, in the light of Jekyll and Hyde as well. So he uses this metaphor uh, and he, the final metaphor I think which is very powerful that he uses is the idea that he describes duality as a dreadful shipwreck. Um, and that is obviously significant because uh, he's almost looking forward to the end of the novel and realising that his discovery, which is that man is made up of you know, good and evil, is actually one that will lead to his own downfall, one that will lead to his own punishment. And it reminds us of the kind of Promethean myth of Jekyll being a man who has accessed forbidden knowledge and has been rightly punished for it. We now come to the most difficult part of the passage, and 
I will read out the quote that I want to discuss. So Jekyll talks about his discovery of duality. He's talked about what led him to this fascination with duality and, and the dual nature of man. He now starts speculating about his scientific theories. And he, he says he's made the dreadful discovery that man is not truly one, but truly two. And then he theorizes and hypothesizes that actually he says others will outstrip me. And I'll read the full quote. He says, others will outstrip me on the same lines. And I hazard the guess that man will ultimately be known for a mere polity of multifarious, incongruous and independent denizens. That is difficult. Let's just break some of these words down. A polity is like a city. Polis in Greek means a city. So he's describing the human mind as being like a city or a, re or, or, or a district. So he's saying man will be known for being a district. Okay, that's, that's the first word. Multifarious means various. In Congress, if something's in Congress, it means it doesn't match with something else. So it, these are kind of, I suppose, they're not in harmony in a sense. So these will be multi multifarious, various, a city of multifarious, which means various um, people not living in harmony independent denizens. A denizen is a personal place that lives in a particular, a person that lives in a particular place. So what he's really talking about here is the idea that he's hazarding the guess and it's relevant really to Freud again, but he's hazarding the guess that man will ultimately be known for having multiple selves, not just two selves like Jekyll and Hyde, but having multiple selves. So he's kind of, it's almost quite, it's quite modern in a sense, this idea that he's proposing he proposes that man will have multiple personalities multiple selves and the idea of the self as being a single stable entity will be disproven think about when we use the words you know i or my in normal la you know everyday language when we when we think about ourselves do, do we really think about ourselves as being one stable thing or do we not actually see ourselves as being uh, various selves that have, that have that have developed through different stages of development in our lives. So I think in if you're a psychology, if you're interested in psychology or if you're a psychology student, I think it's particularly interesting in that regard that it seems rather modern and it kind of links to our understanding of you know the self today. We're not as we're not perhaps as um, confident in our beliefs about the stability of the self as we used to be. So Stevenson proposes multiple selves multiple personalities and that's his prediction for, for where the science will, will end up in the future. He then talks about how he is radically both, he recognises the primitive duality of man within himself and then we get to the crucial revelation of why does he choose to perform this experiment and I'm going to put this under the visualiser. Okay here is our crucial passage, he says I had learned to dwell with pleasure as a beloved daydream on the thought of the separation of these elements. If each I told myself could be but housed in separate identities, life would be relieved of all that was unbearable. Um, and he goes on. I'll let you see it. There you go. Uh, the unjust might go his own way, delivered from the aspirations and remorse of his most upright twin, and the just could walk steadfastly and securely on his upward path doing the good things in which he found his pleasure and no longer exposed to disgrace and penitence by the hands of this extraneous evil. It was the curse of mankind that these incongruous faggots were thus bound together, that in the agonised womb of consciousness these polar twins should be so continuously struggling. How then were they dissociated? So here is our revelation. I know it's difficult. I'll go through this and break this down for you. But here is our revelation about why he chooses to separate the elements. Let's go back to the original to the beginning of the passage and we'll have a close read. So he has a beloved daydream. So really I think the word daydream obviously has connotations of fantasy, uh, of you know wishes and of you know of kind of um, idle pleasures. So it's a daydream initially this idea of the experiment. So it's and I think it's interesting you know that this, it, this experiment has its origins in a dream be it a daydream or, or, or a regular dream. Initially, it's a dream that he wants to separate these, these elements. He wants to separate, uh, by elements, he means his separate parts of his personality. And um, what I was going to say here is, that, again, I brought in Freud a lot throughout this series. And I think there's another uh, Freudian theory that is relevant to this passage, which we call wish, wish fulfillment. Okay? Uh, it's, sorry, I completely spelled that wrong wish fulfillment which is a freudian uh, theory of uh, essentially the idea that um, it's a satisfaction of a desire 
through an involuntary thought process. So you have these desires uh, that, and you think about things that you know, often in daydreams are, po are probably fantasies uh, or hallucinations. Um, and it is a way of achieving something or doing something that you couldn't really do in reality. That's what we mean by a wish fulfillment. So for example, you might dream of being a superhero. You might dream of being someone who could fly. Uh, that's a wish fulfilled. That's a daydream that Freud would look at as being wish fulfillment. So to go back to the passage and why I'm saying this is wish fulfillment on Jekyll's part, it's, it's a fantasy, a desire of his to separate his personality. And what he's doing by conducting this experiment is what we would call in, from a Freudian lens, wish fulfillment. So he wants to separate these identities and then he uses this metaphor, which is fairly, fairly easy to understand. He wants, he wants to house each one in separate identities. So he wants to literally give the evil part of his personality a house. I know it's a body, but it's a house. And the good part of his personality, another house. So that's, that's what he means by housed in separate identities. So one part of his identity will be Jekyll, a separate house. The other one will be Hyde. So he wants to split those two polar twins, as he put it earlier, in two. We still haven't quite answered the question of why. Let's have a look. He continues and he says, there you go. Uh, if he were to do that, life would be relieved of all that was unbearable. And this adjective is particularly powerful. We need to think, well, why is life unbearable for Jekyll at the moment? And it goes back to our simple drawing of the, of the duality of his nature. At the moment, he has to deal with the fact that part of his personality is evil and he's constantly battling that evil side of him. He's constantly trying to repress his evil desires. And that makes life unbearable for him because he feels guilty, he feels shame, ashamed of himself, he feels, uh, he feels um, as if he's a deviant, as if he's, as if he's committing these taboos, and he feels as though his evil side can overpower his good side and diminish his, his goodness, as it were. So life is, this is such an important moment in the novel, life is unbearable for Jekyll prior to the experiment because he is forced to constantly contend with this evil part of himself. And here's his, here's his fantasy. He says, the, if he were to perform this experiment, the unjust might go his own way, delivered from the aspiration and remorse of his upright twin. Okay, that's the first thing. So let's go back to our twin image. Of, I won't show it to you, but let's go, just remember those images of the twin in the womb. He's saying the upright twin, that's, the, that's the, the better of the two, can go his own way. Sorry, rather, wrong way around. He's saying the unjust, that's the evil one, I'll put evil for evil, can go his own way. He can, he can be separated from the good one, the upright one. And the evil part of him could be delivered from hope, delivered from remorse uh, of his upright twin. So essentially he's saying I could set my evil side free and the evil side would be free to do whatever he wants to do. He'd be able to... Uh, achieve whatever he wants to achieve he'd be able to fulfill whatever desires he wants to fulfill then he says the just could walk steadfastly and securely on his upward path so essentially saying you know you could take the low road and I'll take the high road that famous proverb uh, the, the evil character can take the low road the upright twin the noble twin can take the high road and he can live in a moral and virtuous way think about Cain and Abel again here uh, he's saying he can do the good things which he found his pleasure in, and no longer feel, uh, no longer be exposed to disgrace, and no longer have to feel penitent. These, I'm not going to gloss over this, this is very important. Firstly, why, if we answer the question of why does Jekyll feel the need to separate his personalities? Because he fears being exposed to disgrace by his evil side. He feels that eventually he will be caught, uh, and he will be um, disgraced. He will lose his reputation. So that's the first reason that he separates his personality. He fears for his reputation. He's trying to salvage his reputation. He's, he fears disgrace and public humiliation. Really interesting that class comes into it and high and social social status. The fact that he's a Victorian gentleman, perhaps this re, the, the revelation that he actually enjoys committing acts of violence. That he's actually partly evil would destroy him. Secondly, he says penitence. Penitence is, this, is the idea of, you know, of praying for forgiveness. Of, well, we, know what, we know what penitence is, but it's, if you're penitent, you want, you, you want forgiveness. You want to be uh, forgiven. And again, you could use the word guilt here. So he's saying life will be free from feeling guilt about the evil things that I do. 
because the evil part of me will no longer be associated with me. So that's why, that answers the question, that why does he feel the need to, to separate his personality? Reason number one, to preserve his reputation. Reason number two, so that he no longer feels guilt because of the evil part of him. Okay? He then kind of emphatically closes this passage by saying, it's the curse of mankind. So he's saying it's not just in him. Let's get back to my important drawing here. It's not, th this is not just him, this drawing here. He's not the only person made up of good and evil. We are all made up of good and evil in Jekyll's opinion. And in Jekyll's opinion, it's the curse of mankind. He says the curse of mankind, that these incongruous faggots, these faggots that don't, aren't, that don't, um, that don't harmonize, that don't go well together are bound together. What he means here, a faggot is a, is a stick, like, you know, like that. And he's saying these faggots are bound together in a sense. Here's my bound, them being bound together. So he's saying they're bound together involuntarily. And we've just gone back to this uh, metaphor, but I'll show you a picture of it again. He ends with that gothic, sinister metaphor of in the agonized womb of consciousness. So in the, in the human mind, which he compares to a womb, these polar twins should be continuously struggling. So it's this idea I think it's really fascinating. It's almost as if in the womb, these two twins are set to try and kill one another. Uh, it's a really dark and gothic metaphor. This idea of uh, you know, infanticide by these twins, this, uh, this involuntary murder. Uh, and he's saying that's what's taking place in his own mind, that the evil and the good side are trying to are at war constantly and are constantly struggling. And he says, well, how then were they to be dissociated? So he finishes his metaphor on this eerie metaphor of the agonized womb of consciousness and then he goes on to talk about well how is he actually going to to create this experiment and we'll look at that in a different lesson i hope that has clarified what is a very very challenging passage now let's have a, uh, a checkpoint just to cl uh, you know, clear clear your mind uh, and to consolidate your understanding once again we've reached a checkpoint again i would really reiterate that this is probably the most challenging I mean, it is the most challenging chapter of this series it's much much more more difficult than earlier chapters so do feel free to re-watch and rewind uh, and make the most of the video format because it is difficult it is challenging if you need more time than the time i've given you absolutely fine please respond in full sentences and i'll see you shortly thanks very much Hi, welcome back. If you're feeling somewhat nervous about chapter 10 and how difficult it is, do, you know, it, it's okay. Uh, you'll get through chapter 10. Um, it is a difficult chapter. It is a lot more difficult than earlier preceding chapters. But what I will say and what I'll re reiterate really is that it is the most crucial chapter in understanding Jekyll's intentions and understanding uh, Stevenson's, uh, Stevenson's purpose in writing the novel really. Uh, it really does explain fully to us the the, the origin of, of the experiment, you know, what his, Jekyll's background is, and later on the consequence of the experiment. And it's from the perspective of our protagonist. So it's really important that we uh, understand this chapter and we tackle it full on. So if you are feeling worried about how difficult chapter 10 is, I absolutely understand that, but I would urge you to stick with it. Uh, it will pay off because it will give you a much, much better understanding of the novel as a whole. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time where we look at another passage from chapter 10. See, see you shortly. Stay safe and stay well. Goodbye.